Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. So, all week we have been looking at, rightfully so, the person of Jesus. And we've described a number of different titles, names for Jesus. And I'm not going to review each of them now. I would encourage you to yourself go on our YouTube channel um, and listen to each one of them. Each night we had uh, a different person come and speak about something that was unique about the person of Christ. And this evening, on the Feast of the Resurrection, I'd like to close with one final one, which is a title, a way that Jesus was really, I think, uh, perceived and understood chiefly by his disciples early on, which was teacher, teacher. In the Gospel tonight, John chapter 20, verse 14 to 18, it says, She turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Who are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say, Teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren, and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. This evening, I'd like to speak about Jesus, the teacher. And I'd like to do so in light of this glorious event of the resurrection of Christ. And I want to speak specifically about three aspects of the relationship that we find with Mary and the teacher and what that means for us with our great teacher, Jesus Christ. Number one is the teacher we find is able to speak into the dark place or into the places of darkness. As the gospel begins this evening in John chapter 20, verse 1, it says, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark. If you will, Jesus had already risen, right? Jesus had risen. The light of the resurrection had already begun to burst forth. But you find that Mary is in this kind of in-between place, this place of darkness. And what we can understand this to be is that Christ himself, the teacher, by sending his Holy Spirit into our lives and speaking to us through Scripture and through the church, he speaks into our lives and into the dark places or the dark moments of our lives. St. Clement of Alexandria, who was a church father from uh, Alexandria, as the name would suggest, in the second century, he says the following. He says, As we wander in life in deep darkness... We need a guide that cannot stumble or stray. And our guide, the Word, Jesus, is keen-sighted and scans the depths of the heart. He's reminding us something here that as we walk in this world, that oftentimes we find ourselves in moments or places of darkness. And what Christ oftentimes does in those places is nudges us very gently and lovingly. Now, in the New Testament, he is only referred to as, and the word Rabboni, which is the word that Mary used tonight, it's only used twice in the New Testament. The other time that it's used is in Mark chapter 10, verse 51, when Jesus finds this man who was blind, and we read the following. Jesus answered him and said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Rabboni, that I might receive my sight. One of the things that we find about our teacher, our master, Jesus, is that he often, in his own pedagogical approach, his own approach of helping us and teaching us to learn to walk, is he will engage with us through directed questioning. You think Jesus knew what Mary was looking for? Or who Mary was looking for? 
do you think, she asked, he asked her a simple question, who are you looking for? She thought it was the gardener, what, what, what are you looking for? With the man who is blind, same question, what do you want me to do for you? Jesus, rather than directing and oftentimes coming head on, he will ask a question lovingly and gently. What can I do for you? What would you like? Do you want to be made well? And oftentimes, as parents, we find ourselves doing the same for our children. When we find our children, they hurt themselves or they're upset about something because they had an argument or uh, the game got ruined or whatever happened. And we know what's bothering them. Oftentimes, we will still come to them and say, what's going on? What's upsetting you? And this is the loving, gentle way that Jesus oftentimes, we find him approaching people in the scripture, is with a gentleness in order that he might speak into the dark places. What oftentimes happens when we're in place of darkness is we get scared, right? Anyone here afraid of the dark? All right, a few of you are shaking your head. No one look around, okay? Okay. But oftentimes what people, when they're afraid of the dark, they will kind of ball up in order to protect themselves. And I think it's no different with Christ. When we're in a place of fear or uncomfort, what we do is we oftentimes put up walls and boundaries between us and him and us and others. And so what he does in order to be able to penetrate into those dark places, the place of fear, the place of uncertainty, is he approaches us very gently, oftentimes with a very simple question that we ourselves have to wrestle with. The second aspect of the relationship with the teacher is there is a willing submission of the disciple to the teacher's authority. The word Rabboni is a longer form of the word rabbi. And rabbi just simply means teacher. Now, in the Chaldean text, the translation is oftentimes translated for that word, lord, master, chief, or prince. You can see that there's a deep respect for the Rabboni. There is a willingness to submit to his authority in the life of the person. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17, we find the reason for this submission. It's not in order just to simply rule over the life of the person, but it's for the sake of the soul that sometimes we don't understand what it is that we're being asked to do, right? I mean, I didn't get this, I think, until I had kids, that sometimes my kids wanna, wanted to, hopefully wanted to in the past tense, uh, put their fingers in the socket, right? Sometimes they wanted to play with fire. Sometimes they wanted to take scissors and start cutting up like clothes and robes and stuff like that. Sometimes, like, they don't understand all the nuances. They just need to know, mommy and daddy said so, and you need to listen. As much as we try to explain, sometimes it goes over their head, okay? They don't understand that I can't just pick up another robe from Walmart or ShopRite. It just doesn't work like that, okay? So sometimes you just, it's not about being an authoritarian. It's sometimes you just say, like, you explain, and then you say, but listen, you just, just listen and obey. Listen and obey, even when you don't understand. And what Christ the teacher, by sending his Holy Spirit once again and through the church, continues to do is to shape and train us as while we're still in that place of darkness, of cloudiness, of uncertainty, he continues to do so. But when Mary comes to Jesus and she seeks to cling to him, he gives her an instruction. He tells her, do not cling to me, for I've not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I'm ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God. And as a result of that, her willing submission to obey 
something that she was certainly the first one to hear the message. There must have been some discomfort on one side, but a willing submission to say, if this is what the Master is telling me to do, I'm going. And I think one of the things that I really want to encourage as disciples of Christ is that we learn to develop this spiritual sensitivity where when Christ asks us to do something, and I'm not talking about blind faith here, I'm not, not talking about that. We use our minds, our hearts, our soul, we use our whole being to know and to worship God. I'm not talking about turning off the brain, okay? Turning off our minds. What I am suggesting though is sometimes we are, we're all on this journey where we are trying to learn and grow and we will be doing that for all of eternity. But in the meantime, what we are being told here, and this is in, in Hebrews 13, verse 17, is obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls. The idea here is that when Christ is instructing us to do something, it's for the betterment of our soul. And quite frankly, there's times where you and I don't fully get the whole picture, but we say, Lord, I, I don't get it, but I'll do as you call me to do. Because you are Rabboni. You're not just teacher, the guy who sits in the classroom. You are my master. I think part of the issue is that our modern notion of discipleship, of the teacher-disciple relationship, is quite warped in comparison to early Christian thinking on this. Early Christian thinking on this was the disciples walked, Jesus walked rather, and wherever he went, the disciples were there. And he spoke, and they were waiting on bated breath to hear what he had to speak. And they were willing to submit to his every word. Even when they came up short, they would kind of, he would correct them and then redirect them. Number three, and finally, Someone pointed out to me that one of the things that's really unique about this relationship is the pursuit of the disciple, the pursuit of Mary. So yes, we have the teacher who is able to speak in the dark places. And by the way, he's been doing this since the days of Adam and Eve. He's been speaking into the dark places. And there have been those who understand the need to submit willingly to the authority, but have not always done so. But what you find with Mary is this person who has a deep fixation, who has become transfixed, who has become captivated by the person of Jesus, by the master, by the teacher. She got up and she, if you will, like give you an image when a guy is trying to get to know a girl, he, and he really wants to get to know her, he puts on the full court press, right? I mean, he doesn't just like send a message and say, hey, it'd be nice, you know, what do you think? And if she says, no, not interested, he doesn't give up. I mean, beyond, I'm not talking to the point of harassment here, people, okay? <laughs> but Mary got up early, she went, she pursued Everyone else was sleeping. It was dark. It was probably unsafe. But she said, I need to go and find the master. I need to go and find the teacher. Mary is pursuing. And as soon as he calls her, her name, she responds. There's an intimacy that's there. There is a closeness that's there. The strength in the relationship. God has always been speaking to us. He's always been speaking. If you look back on your life, whether you are in elementary school, or you are a great-grandparent, if you look back on your life and you pause, you'll know and you'll see that God has always been speaking. We haven't always responded, we haven't always listened, but he's always been speaking. What Mary does is she pursues the voice of the Master. I want to close with a final verse for you from 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 to 12. St. Peter says, But you are God's special possession, who called you out of darkness into his wonderful lights. 
Like, listen to how beautiful that is. You are God's special possession who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles when they speak against you as evil doers. He calls each of us by name out of the darkness. The light of Christ bursting forth from the tomb transforms, as we heard in the message from the Pope, the disciples from cowards to courageous men. It settled their confusion. It transformed Mary into the first evangelist. This evening, as we continue in prayer, I would ask you that as you stand and pray, that you look to the risen Christ who is right here in our midst. We haven't always seen him, but he's always been there. We might not have always pursued or put on the full court press hard enough, but now is the time. The, the psalm that we read said, today is the day. Today is the day. I uh, want to congratulate you truly on this blessed feast of ours, in which case, at which time we look to our loving teacher who's in our midst, who's calling us by name, and who's seeking to continue walking with us and for us to walk with him, the risen Christ. All glory be to his name forever. Amen.